Hey everyone, it's Justin. In this video, we're going to be talking about one possible cause of why your audio might not be exporting properly from Adobe Premiere Pro. Let's get started. Starbucks coffee? Homemade coffee in a Starbucks cup. Nothing against Starbucks, but my coffee's better. If you're new to the channel, we talk about tech, travel, photography, videography, and sometimes a little bit of finance. If you're already a subscriber, then it's good to see you again. A few years ago, I published a video on this very topic. I proposed a solution, but it was kind of hacky, it only worked some of the time, but the biggest problems were that it only worked on Mac, and it made the file blow up in size. Today we have a much better solution, and despite that old video being super lame and almost cringeworthy to watch, I had just started out on YouTube after all, it's my most viewed video, and it remains one of the most popular ones to this day, which means one of two things, either Adobe hasn't fixed the problem yet, I wouldn't know because I switched to Final Cut Pro a long time ago, but that's for another video, or two, a lot of you haven't upgraded yet, to which I say, come on, it's 2021, get with the times. But also I understand a lot of times you can't upgrade software because you have plugins that might fail to work, or your company or somebody you're working with hasn't updated yet, or you're on a non-subscription version and you refuse to subscribe to Adobe Creative Cloud. At any rate, I should have made this video a long time ago because you guys keep asking me questions on this topic. So finally I got up today, I said, I gotta sit down, I gotta make this video, so here we are. Now, the fix itself is very simple, but before we dive into it, let's take a step back and see what's going on here. Now when we're talking about video, we obviously have the source video encoded in some specific format, and we also have the output video after we're done editing, and we want to save it to an MPEG to upload to YouTube or something like that. And in each of these steps, we have encoders. Encoders take the raw audio and video data and put them into a special file format so they can be read by the computer and your editing software. Now my previous fix involved selecting a decoder that just happened to solve the issue, but as I said before, it only worked on Mac, it was one of Apple's ProRes encoders, and it made the file size huge, which was not a long-term solution. And so in this video, we're going to be focusing on that source video encoder format, which is the better and more sustainable long-term way to fix this problem. Now, now when we're talking about encoders, whether they're on the source side or the export side, they broadly fall into two different categories. The first one being constant frame rate, and the second one being variable frame rate. And based on the name, you can probably guess how each of these work. With constant frame rate footage here, where we have a fixed frame rate of delta t of say 1 24th of a second, then if we look at our timeline t, we're going to see at each interval of time here, we're going to have a frame of audio and video data that represents a time window of delta t. So here's delta t, here's a time period of delta t, here's another time period of delta t, and so on. Now on the flip side, when we're looking at variable frame rate footage, then what do our delta t's look like? And now this is a subtle but important distinction to make. You might have told the camera to record at 24 frames per second, which translates into 1 24th of a second per frame. However, your camera's codec, which is taking the raw sensor data and writing it to a file on your memory card, might decide a little bit differently in order to optimize storage space. And so if we look at our timeline again, then we'll see that during periods of high activity, the codec will save data at a more frequent rate. However, where there are periods with less activity going on, the codec might decide to increase that window size or decrease the sampling rate. And you can see where we have more activity going on, we need more data in order to capture what's going on from frame to frame. But when we have less going on, we can save storage space by writing data down less frequently. For example, you can imagine that it takes a lot more data, and thus more frames, to capture all the activity of this fast-moving subject flying around the two limb ruins in order to describe the changes from frame to frame. In fact, this is exactly why we recorded frame rates like 60 and 120 frames per second, or even higher, even though the output footage is going to be in, say, only 24 frames per second. Compare that to how much easier it is to capture this iguana right here. Wait, did that thing just look at me? And so you can imagine a real-world video might have a lot of variability in the frame rate. And so this sort of variable frame rate footage appears to be the source of the problems that Adobe Premiere Pro presents when performing certain operations or working with certain codecs when exporting your timeline. And so the place you're most likely to find these variable frame rate codecs being used is on your mobile phone, where you have limited storage space. And this will be all good and fine, but it appears that some components of Adobe Premiere Pro, at least in some versions, have problems interpreting this variable frame rate footage and especially with matching the audio up to the video. And I believe this to be the root cause of why your audio suddenly drops out on export, because the decoder essentially says, hey, I can't match this up anymore, I'm just gonna stop outputting audio. And so armed with that knowledge, I'm gonna jump on the computer here and show you what the fix looks like, so you can use it to fix this problem or future similar problems down the road. All right, here we are in Premiere. I've got a project open and I've got a few clips on the timeline with some footage that I shot with my iPhone for my trip in Mexico and I suspect that they're probably encoded with variable frame rate. And now you'll notice next to each file, 
Premiere displays the frame rate. I record on the iPhone at approximately 30 frames per second, or 29.98, but again, you have to remember that's just the nominal frame rate. Within that file, the specific data frames will have variable frame rates. So the first thing you're going to want to do is look at the properties of the source file. So to do that, go over here to the project panel, right click on one of your files, go to properties, and you'll see here, Premiere says variable frame rate detected, so our suspicions have been confirmed, and this file has been encoded with variable frame rate. Okay, so we know that's probably the issue, so let's close that panel. Now, Adobe reportedly added functionality to handle this, but from what I could tell, at least the last time that I used Premiere, remember, I switched to Final Cut, it's been a long time, but the last time I tried it, it still didn't work. And since that time, Adobe support was kind enough to put up a web page describing the issue, where they do talk about variable frame rate, and some common examples of where it might come from, as well as how to address audio video sync. So they give you the option to either preserve the audio sync or to use smoother video, but that's different than our problem where the audio drops out completely during export. So let's see what other options we have. Now the very bottom of this page gives you a hint as to what the solution might be. Preserve audio sync function may not work. In such cases, it's recommended to transcode the media files to constant frame rate and then use them in Premiere. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Now it's up to you how you want to do this, but my favorite method is to use a program called Handbrake, which is free to download and it works really well. Alright, so here's what the program looks like when you first open it. But before we get started, to keep things organized, I'm going to make a folder inside of our source footage folder, and I'm going to call it Transcoded. So we can tell Handbrake to use this folder for the output, and keep everything separate from our original source files. Alright, so back in Handbrake, all you have to do is go to Open Source, and now if you only have one file to deal with, and you can just click on that file and you can hit open. But in our case, we have several files here, six files. So I'm going to select the folder that contains those files and hit open. What Handbrake is going to do, it's going to scan all those files. Now, if you go to the drop down here, you'll notice it scanned all the files. So here's a little tip. These files were small and that scan process was pretty fast, but I've noticed if you have really large files and perhaps you're doing this in batches, if you come back here and you keep dropping files into that same folder, then every time you open that folder, it's going to rescan all the files in that folder. And so you might just want to make a new folder every time you do another batch. I don't know why it starts with number two, so just ignore that. It doesn't really mean anything. So next, we're going to go to the video tab. We're going to select the frame rate that we want for the output files. I want 24 frames per second. Pick what you want here. But here's the important part. We're going to pick constant frame rate. And you can play around with the other settings here, but I found that the defaults work pretty well. The next thing you'll want to do is go down here to browse and select the folder for your output files. And for our purposes, we're going to select that transcoded folder that we made just a few minutes ago. And at this point, you're ready to start transcoding. Now, if you hit start, it's only going to transcode this one file that you have selected. And of course, you could come and do each one of these one by one. But what I prefer to do is go up here, hit add to queue. Now here, you have to do that for each one, which is a little bit tedious. However, once you do that, then you can come here, you can hit Q, make sure everything's here, looks like it is, and then I can hit Start Q. Now at this point, these are small files, they don't take too long, but if you have a lot of files or you have large files, then at this point I'd recommend stepping away from the computer for a few minutes, make yourself a coffee, pour yourself a beer, get a glass of wine, whatever it takes, because this process can take a while. All right, so when everything is finished, You'll get this little pop-up, your handbrake queue is done, so hit OK, and exit handbrake, come back to Premiere, and at this point you have two options. If you have a new project, you haven't put anything in the timeline yet, then you can start a new project, drag your transcoded footage into the timeline, and you can work from there. But if you're in this situation where you already have a timeline, you don't necessarily want to go through and recreate the timeline, delete everything, drag everything back in, then what you can do is you can come over here to the project panel, right click, and you can go to replace footage. Go over here to the transcoded folder. Here's all of our output. Select the appropriate file. Again, be careful here, don't mix these up because these might not be in the same order as they are in the project panel here. So here's file 3300. And here you go, you'll see that the frame rate is now 24 frames per second, as we specified in Handbrake. And in our case, the file extension changed because we output in MP4 format and the source files were in MOV, movie, but your mileage may vary. So unfortunately, there's no easy way to get around this. You literally have to come in here and do this for each file. And the other thing to be careful of is every time you come to replace footage, Premiere puts you in the location of the source. So you don't want to select that file. You want to go to Transcoded and select this one. They didn't make it easy. All right, so I'll do the rest of these quickly. This folder thing gets me every time. 3097. 
Okay, so we've replaced all the footage, so now we can come back to the timeline, hit play, and make sure everything's okay. So yeah, video looks good. Sound is good. Man, I wish I was back there. Okay, so at this point, you're basically done. All you wanna do is go through your timeline and make sure everything lines up correctly. What I've found sometimes is that due to the interpretation of the footage during the transcoding process, sometimes you'll get little shifts in your subclips. So you just wanna go through your timeline and make sure that everything still lines up properly. The other thing I found is that if you're using warp stabilizer and you previously analyzed that footage and applied stabilization, you'll have to go through and repeat that process for each clip. And now if all this sounds too tedious and you're in the situation where you only have a few clips that don't have audio, then you can try to be selective about this process. And this might work because I've found that the longer the clips are, the more likely they are to have audio problems compared to shorter clips. But again, your mileage may vary. And that's everything. You're ready to go and export your timeline. And you can freely use whatever format that you want to. Now you might ask, what do I do with these transcoded files when I'm done? Because they do take up extra storage space. And I'd say that's up to you. If you're done with the project, you can get rid of them. You can always transcode again if you really need to. But even if you decide to keep these files, I'd argue that's a better trade-off than having to use that Apple ProRes format during export and you get that really large file format that just takes hours to upload. And one other thing, the only reason I found this fix was because I reached out to Adobe Technical Support. So don't forget that you're paying for that software, you always have that option to reach out to support. So I hope you found this video to be helpful. If you did, consider smashing the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.